will share the microphones. I'll take the box. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll take the clicker if you have it. Uh, so I think we this one up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we know a few people in this room from coming to other events. My name is Denis Carr. I'm the supervisor from the IT side of the Open Data Project. Uh, so I guess we'll talk maybe about three kind of key pieces today. So um, where we're at with the Open Data Master Plan, the direction that we're going, and uh, how that's being informed through consultations, and what we've been hearing so far from these consultations. So it's important, I think, to talk about that, you know, we're, we're not just at the beginning of this process. Uh, put your hand up if you were, came to our, either our March 3rd event or our March 30th event. Well, there was a couple of people. Were, was anybody at a public consultation for the Open Data Master Plan so far? Okay, yeah, so there's a few. Um, so we build a relationship with the City of Toronto with Open North, but the other really big uh, collaborator is all of you, all the people in the public, and um, we've been both very patient and very driven when it comes to open data. Uh, on March 3rd, we kind of kicked off a process of trying to experiment on how to co-create together. So how to co-create documentation, policy, informed direction, and in the direction that the open data should be going. On March 3rd, we tried to put together a back best practices document at the same time as with the province, but identifying, preparing, publishing, and activating open data. And on the 30th was really our kickoff of uh, developing an open data master plan. Um, we had a series of engagements within it, but it was particularly activities that were designed to help us see if we were on the right track about creating a blueprint of what should be in an open data master plan. Uh, we looked at some of the council priorities that came in. There was 21 recommendations, and we uh, tasked the group with having to help identify like how we should prioritize these, or how we should tackle them, what direction we should go on them. Uh, we looked at uh, areas of opportunity and challenges, and uh, tried to tap the experience of the audience to see like, what's going on in other cities, or what have you learned through your own connections uh, in advancements in open data. So these pieces kind of fit into an overall puzzle together. So not only do we have we been trying to do ongoing consultations, but uh, members of the city as well as the Open Data team have been coming to Civic Tech Toronto. We're trying to tightly integrate with incubator groups like DMZ or uh, learn from the Open Data Exchange that's learning about the business sector and open data and how open data is being used to uh, commercialize data sets and generate an economy. Also with the Open Data Book Club. And there's also a key piece of, well, Open data has been on the flag for city council for a long time. And there's a, a compendium of staff reports and meeting minutes. And all of this kind of fed into a direction uh, after the March 30th of a staff report that said, was our progress update. You can look it up if you want. It's uh, Executive 2410 from the Executive Committee. And it was an update report of how are we going to go and approach the development of the Open Data Master Plan. And what a key piece that came out of that is uh, the city should be developing this plan in isolation. We should really use it as an activity to co-create together with the community. And what we really wanted was uh, a partner to help us steward uh, this co-creation. And we found that partner in Open North, both as one of Canada's, or if not Canada's, leading uh, steward in open data. And part of that was creating uh, a mechanism to gather feedback around the Open Data Master Plan through internal consultations, external consultations um, with targeted specific stakeholders, but also just the public at large, uh, as well as maybe focused consultations on particular themed areas, which we'll talk about as well. Another key piece that came out of both our uh, March 30th consultation, as well as some of the motions from Council, was that it was important to create a public advisory body to help steward all the feedback that we were receiving into an actionable, not just master plan, but a roadmap that set out what were the course of activities and priorities that we should focus on over the next four years. The open data, uh, the other piece in the whole governance structure is the, the public advisory committee is an external body, so a public advisory committee, but there's also an internal one within the city, the open data committee, and creating a relationship between those two bodies. One thing that came out of the March 30th event as we were testing the water on this blueprint approach to co 
creation of an open data master plan was four key principles. And we tested this, the pulse with this, with our audience at the time, to be like, if we develop an open data master plan, they should be guided by four main principles. And those are, everything we do should be co-created with the public, including the documentation and process and progress that we make uh, as we generate artifacts around the open data master plan. This master plan should really be focused not just on creating new data sets, but really releasing and developing data sets that focus on civic issues. The other piece is focusing on improving the way the city works, so internal efficiencies, but also how uh, the city in general works with the different divisions together, but also with the community. And a big piece of it was also in, uh, sorry, becoming more inclusive and decreasing the barriers that exist to open data. So part of that as well is um, making open data a digestible thing for more than one audience. So how do we make it inclusive that anybody can see the value and benefit of open data? Uh, okay, so we came in, well actually I was hired, my first day was on uh, June 26th, whenever I speak to everybody, they say, that's all you've been working on this? That's nothing. But this work predates us by months, uh, starting with the March 30th event, but even earlier than that, we've been working on this for quite a while. Um, whether it was directly or indirectly, let's say. But one of the really cool opportunities with this project is the Open Data Charter. So the Open Data Charter is an international uh, collaboration between governments and experts uh, working on open data. And uh, Open North is actually a steward of this charter. And it comes with uh, six principles. Uh, the great key piece of a Open Data Charter is that it helps governments uh, speak the same language. What do you mean by open by default? Well, the charter sets that out in great detail. Uh, so when two governments, uh, like the federal government, for example, just uh, adopted the, the charter, when they're talking about open data, they mean open data by the definition of the open data charter. Um, and we're in a, in a really neat position where we can have the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipal government be speaking the same language. It's so rare to get three different jurisdictions in a room talking about the same issues with the same language, with the same definitions. So it, it, that's exciting on one end, uh, but it's an exciting end broadly because globally, nobody has really done that. Uh, a lot of cities all over the world have adopted the charter, uh, and a lot of governments have done so, but not in that kind of alignment, which is a really exciting opportunity for the public to explore. But more broadly, as we explore uh, with open data, Open Data Charter, um, it, it's a vision of sorts of what open data, how you can really maximize the potential of open data. Using open by default, uh, common concepts, accessible and usable, uh, comparable and interoperable uh, for improved governance and citizen engagement and for inclusive development and uh, So, this is our timeline headlines, and every time I see it, a little bit of anxiety comes into me. Uh, but basically, what you really need to know is that we're going to be submitting a staff report to the Executive Committee uh, in late October. But before that, a lot of work needs to get done. Uh, we need to go to Open Data Committee. As I uh, mentioned, they're a key part of our entire process. And also, um, development of uh, deliverables, uh, the engagement, which is uh, consultations, and possibly the use of online tools. And uh, the advisory group, as you will see, plays a, a very big role from the very beginning. Uh, and it's uh, actually, we're going to be having our first meeting on Monday. And uh, we're excited to kick that off. So speaking of the deliverables, um, we're looking on um, all, all the deliverables will have uh, various content that uh, takes in the feedback we received at the various phases of the consultation from the phase one to the phase two that I'm talking about. But it's basically the feedback that we received from, yes, the public, but also the internal stakeholders, the external stakeholders, the open data committee, the advisory group. We have our ears listen throughout the whole process, basically. Um, and the progress report will be delivered to the executive committee, as I mentioned, in the fall. So phase one, consultation. Uh, so like any uh, beginning consultation, we're looking at a very broad beginning. Uh, we looked at public, community groups, the city tech community, of course, uh, academia, startups, the city of Toronto's agencies and divisions. And our goal was really to present
extent of the overall approach. Uh, for those of you that were at the initial uh, public consultation, you will see the process of change quite drastically. Uh, and you will also see that uh, our demo rules have changed slightly. Uh, but also, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to check whether this process makes sense, uh, whether it is any feedback that we should take into account earlier on. So let's get into the fun stuff. What it is that we heard over uh, three consultations and five hours of notes to Chief Pratt. Uh, so basically, I think the coolest thing that happened from the public consultation, um, and believe it or not, during the whole consultation, there was like a jackhammer going in the next room, uh, is that we heard some, some of the concerns, like you would think you heard from uh, internal stakeholders. Like the, the challenges and solutions that you see here are very much the solutions and challenges that you would get from public service. Uh, whether it was, you know, methodology of uh, data collection, or whether it was, you know, privacy and, you know, the tension that comes with uh, fulfilling accessibility and privacy standards, uh, efficiencies that are possible for the city, but uh, broadly, but also the challenges that come with data silence, uh, data have not but um, there's also plenty of solutions that can be exciting opportunities. I think some of the ones that uh, stuck the most out to me was uh, software standardization. I wasn't quite expecting the public to get uh, so into the weeds of solutions, uh, but they were uh, eager and, and very much knowledgeable about where to go. But also an, a, a real appetite to have access to the city, uh, the data and custodian. The people that actually work to really do that. Uh, now, what did you hear from the external consultation? Uh, so the external consultation was a much smaller group. Um, it was on a, a bit of a tough week with a long weekend coming up. But what I think uh, really stuck out to us is that uh, there, there was a lot of um, food for thought, I'd like to say. Part, part of it was that, you know, um, Open data is like a lot of the buzzwords that are around. To us, it's second nature, but not, it's not for everybody. And we needed to ensure that it was well defined. So data literacy, uh, that, you know, it's not just about data literacy. You really need to make uh, an investment of true engagement that comes along with open data. Uh, there was also the holistic versions of data sets. Different formats that allow people with different technical skills to engage. Um, the technical and physical limitations of the data uh, is important to make a difference uh, with making sure that users learn the concept of data, how data works. A lot of this data is cool, but it means nothing if you don't know the context in which it operates, the context in which it was created, uh, the context in which it was changed. And uh, there's also a little bit of uh, there was a little bit of a conversation on the tension that comes with open data and commercializing that data. Uh, because obviously it takes tremendous effort to uh, run through an enterprise data set to push it out into the public. Um, you know, we heard that it took um, an additional like six to eight months to get one single data set out. Uh, and that's, you know, it, it sounds like a lot, but when you think about it practically, it's six to eight months out of your day's work set aside to do this one project that you may or may not know <laughs> leads to anything interesting. And that's asking a lot of public servants uh, and the external consultation. A lot of uh, people that came to that event pointed out that was one thing to keep in mind. And uh, just as there's tremendous uh, data power, it's also very siloed. Uh, it's not just issues of making data accessible to the public. So you start seeing these trends uh, that it seems like the external stakeholders are talking public sector language and the public is also talking public sector language. But that's really exciting because it validates uh, what we think is going on. Uh, but it also sets up the opportunity to really tackle these issues and prioritize them as we look to the next three to five years. Uh, and now what we heard from the internal consultation, I think uh, just as it is with any project that you're looking at uh, government transformation that's created a business, which open data very much has the potential to do, 
is that if this master's plan is to succeed, we are looking at an organizational wide COVID change. Um, and that means moving past counting the assets and downloads because you know measuring your progress is just not that simple. And you know, you need to stop doing this at the side of your desk. If it takes six to eight months to cut out the asset, then it should be somebody's job description. It shouldn't just be something that went on someone's desk. Um, and you need to establish a communication uh, feedback loop to understand how this data is used. Um, there was instances where somebody would say, you know, somebody asked me a question, but I, I have no idea what, what they did with it, was it helpful, did it actually solve the problem? So there, there's a real need to connect uh, with different people that are talking about the same issues with the same concerns. And just like we heard in other conversations, is to make it easier to access information within the city um, and potentially tackle the silence inside and outside of that. There's a real barrier with uh, public access and data. It is just as big of a hassle and burden for people inside to get that data. So now we're looking at uh, the next steps when we're looking to the future. So the phase two of consultations, uh, we have an internal stakeholder consultation that's going next week. Um, and then we also have a cluster external uh, consultation on the August 30th and 31st. And uh, we have a cluster of mixed external and internal stakeholders on the first. Uh, so it's been a busy week for us. As we've this one actually. Uh, and if you saw the, the cluster wording on the slides, uh, this is something we're playing around with. Uh, for phase two, it is not something you would have heard if you came to the first um, consultation. If you want to do engagement on an issue that is cross government, that will really impact potentially impact uh, how people do their day to day work, you ideally like, would spend a lot of time talking to vision people impacted, uh, but we unfortunately don't have uh, the timeline to do that. We would be working on this forever. <laughs> and what we came up with was the idea of clusters. So take an issue. Uh, we've chosen smart space, urban resilience, and uh, bring stakeholders, for, for this case would be external stakeholders, around the roots. And then for the third cluster, the open, smart, and resilient city cluster, we would bring internal and external stakeholders. Um, and if any of you do public consultation in your day-to-day -day work, this isn't how you do it. This is quite different from the process you do it. There's a tried and true test that formulates public consultation, and it doesn't look anything like this. Uh, which is, um, it, you know, it's a true st a testament to the city uh, that they're willing to try new things. And uh, this is our, our first foray into really uh, shaking things up a little bit outside. And this cluster will focus on problem framing. It will be solution development and uh, performance indicators. So what we'll be looking at is like smart city, for example. It's a very broad concept. Uh, it has a lot of interest. It affects a lot of divisions. And open data, uh, as Amin always used this, um, this metaphor, that open data has the potential to be the electricity that powers a lot of these initiatives and really helps them succeed. So it's about getting into the weeds of how open data can help um, the collective um, and we're also going to be grounding this on the International Open Data uh, Maturity Models. I don't know if you guys are too familiar with uh, maturity models. It's just basically um, a spectrum of where the city might be at in uh, achieving uh, the different principles of the Open Data Chart. Um, but we're very much committed to grounding this work on the Open Data Charter and uh, again going back to the ability to speak the same language and go back to the ability to look at big projects and uh, very concretely explain how open data has a potential to help them, um, has a, a relevance to it. Because when you say open data, um, some people in the room will say that's cool. Some people will say, I don't know what that is, but that sounds cool. But some people will say, that's not for me. And by attaching some of these uh, clusters, we have an opportunity to bring people in that wouldn't necessarily see their work as part of open data. And uh, to me, that's particularly exciting because some of these conversations, like urban resilience, are at the core of um, this future of cities. Uh, resilience.
Williams looks at climate change, for example, and we know from the Calgary floods that climate change has the, the ability to cripple urban economies uh, in any way. So uh, for phase three, we're looking at uh, internal stakeholder competition on September 15th, but we're also looking at our next public competition. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about a little bit about it. Um, so we have all these moving pieces. We've done a, a, a number of public consultations internal. We're talking about this cluster model, like moving away from broad consultation, focusing on a specific theme or area, and bringing the right stakeholders to talk about that, and looking at how that might be a different type of output that we get from it. Maybe it's more targeted. Maybe it has specific deliverables that would fit on our roadmap for this four-year roadmap that we're trying to do about open data. So we want to take a step at that point and do this phase three version. So before going to city council again and saying, this is a progress report, this is the direction that we want to go, we want to do the same thing that we did on March 30th. Let's do another touch point um, internally and externally around the progress that we've, we've had already, what we thought was successful on it, and how we want to continue moving forward. Uh, on the March 30th event, we also did a, a brief demonstration of a beta or an alpha, really, essentially on a uh, new open data portal and data visualization portal. We want to follow up with that and showcase how far we've got with uh, that beta right now. And we're going to want to release that beta, so it's going to be a bit of a, a public demonstration of it. And we'll have the staff and team there so we can talk and ask questions about it. So we want to keep cycling back to this whole methodology of do consultation, get some feedback from people, synthesize that, use our um, open data public advisory group to help us steward that into a structure and format that looks like an open data plan and roadmap, test it with a pulse again with our internal and external stakeholders, and then go back and report to council. Continue this kind of model so that we don't develop something in isolation with never touching back with our communities. Yeah, and the only other thing I would add is that Right now, there's a lot of really incredible initiatives happening in the city. And Open Data has an opportunity to link them up in a really interesting and exciting way. Uh, so we're hoping that the cluster model will showcase that a little bit more concretely. Uh, and now, uh, the advisory group. Uh, so this is uh, one of my favorite parts. Uh, we're going to have, as I mentioned, our first meeting next Monday. It has 42 individuals. And that seems like a lot. Uh, that's actually not unprecedented. I did a little bit of reading, and the city of Toronto has actually done uh, a lot of really large uh, advisory groups. Um, the planning review panel actually has 28 members. Um, I think the Toronto Waterfront also did a couple that had 40 people. Uh, so it's it's a little large, and it's definitely larger than we envisioned. Uh, originally, I think we said we'd have just 10 people. But this model allows us to, again, do things a little bit differently. Uh, it allows us to use them as a sounding board, but also do some really neat uh, facilitation things that I'm excited about. And uh, I'm sure some of us can tell you about that on uh, Tuesday night next week. Um, because we do have quite a bit of uh, strong representation from the city front community. And uh, really, what led us to this model was that we received a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and that was presented in the volume, and uh, given the broad level of expertise we were looking at, it was a really unique opportunity to adopt a more inclusive model and take hold of all these expertise. So, how can you help? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, the advisory group has a strong representation from the uh, community. Uh, you're more than welcome to approve some of them are in the room right now. Go ahead and put your hands up. There we go. See? So I'm, I'm sure they would be more than glad to bring your concerns to the table. And uh, we also have a survey uh, that, that we uh, published this week, I think on Monday night. And so you're more than welcome to fill it out. It's uh, basically like our consultation in a box, I would say. <laughs> that would be a good way to put it. Uh, but if you have, you know, more thoughts or anything of that nature, you're more than welcome to uh, use the email at the bottom to play it and to send an email to the Open Data team. And as I mentioned, uh, our next public meeting is on September 15th, so please come out. Uh, it will be very exciting. 
Um, so Winston was shaking things up and at the portal. I see some of what they're working on. And I gotta say, I'm really impressed. Uh, in my work before at the uh, Socialization Foundation, I was exposed to a lot of like innovation teams and a lot of the hubs. And I'm genuinely impressed by the balance of talent that the social media team has achieved. Uh, it's not the kind of balance you see on like, all the teams in this innovation hub. Um, and, you know, when we talk about open, one of the four key guiding principles, uh, doing our work in the open, this is the start of it. And then yeah, sure. uh, so we just updated our website, I think, on Friday to start to kick off um, how we can continue the conversation. So first of all, we wanted it to be as open as possible and broad engagement as possible. So that's why the survey, like uh, Karen was talking about, it's like a consultation in a box. So for individuals who don't have time to come out to one of the consultations but still want to give feedback, or if you thought of something uh, if, after the consultation and you want to give feedback, here's a universal mechanism to submit it. But also we want to start being able to share all the artifacts from uh, the consultations that we've already had. Right now I think there's links up for the March 3rd, March 30th event. And then as we've had the internal and external consultations, we like to put those summaries up there as well. So that's a, a place to continuously check out. We'll also use it as an announcement board for any of our ongoing consultation activities. Sure. And I'd just like to add that, like, I, I know this is it's just one page. But a lot of work went into making this public. Um, when you talk to uh, internal communications about whether other divisions of the city are uh, publishing their work, their progress, the answer is no. <laughs> so I, you know, it's really kudos to the Oceanic team to really walk and talk. But as I mentioned, please fill out uh, feedback if you didn't get a chance to come to the conversation. We had a lot of interest. Be happy to uh, sit on the side yeah. after if you want to come over and have a, a chat. Okay, uh, Bruce, how do you get to the survey? How do you click uh, screen share? Yes, yeah, so if you hit the toronto.ca slash open, you'll have open data master plan. Find out more, right underneath the picture, click on that, and you'll see uh, there's, some, there's some text, and then there's a, a little, uh, little section. There's a, there's a big service. banner. The open data master plan. It, it's hard to mix. <laughs> okay, and then my question was I know you mentioned that sometimes it would take six to eight months to get data um, out to the public, but is that kind of related to kind of an investment cost or a learning curve? Like, does it become easier after and more efficient? Well, I, I'll mention that was like one of the extremes. Oh. Like, that was a very, very extreme. Um, but I can talk to, yeah, more. a couple. I mean, I can go in for the depth. Let me just make maybe something quicker. Uh, often you hear the case of like, oh, it's difficult to pull out of legacy systems or the, you know, the data was designed in a different way and a lot of massaging necessarily has to be done. Um, there's pieces, we just released Toronto Paramedic Services data. And that one was particularly challenged, one just because of the volume. So these are all the incident calls from, kind of similar to what Toronto Fire Services produces. Uh, but through it, uh, so the TPS, the Toronto Paramedic Services, is also a private health information data custodian. So it comes under different rules. So it was a challenge for us to, because uh, we're starting to go into this new space of, uh, in the big data analytics world, do combinations of data sets be anonymized individuals? And so that was really a first big leap forward in trying to tackle that challenge. And so to go through all those, those pieces, one, to reformat five years worth, millions of uh, uh, data records to get into that piece and then do a privacy assessment on it uh, and do an analysis of whether that then, you know, uh, releases any private information. Those steps can take, so that one I think was like four months in the work, uh, but different ones have different kind of challenges. But like, as you also said, once a process is established, it allows us to do the mechanism of updating much more efficiently. So usually the update process is way I, I know that we're, we're running out of time, so maybe any other additional questions, happy to answer them over to the side. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we do need to move on.
gone to the rest of our evening, but Karen, you know, you're going to be 